The wrist is a synovial condyloid joint formed from the distal radius, the distal ulna, and the proximal carpal row, which is made up of the scaphoid, lunate, and triquitral. In addition, a stabilizing triangular articular disc sits between the distal radius and ulna and the proximal carpal row. The wrist is supported by the collateral, palmar, and dorsal ligaments. The hand is formed from a complex network of joints between the carpal, metacarpal, and phalangeal bones. The ligamentous structures is intricate and allows the hand to function with flexibility and dexterity, but with stability when needed. The wrist and hand are innervated by the median, ulna, and radial nerves. Correct assessment and treatment of the hand is extremely important, as impairment can lead to both physical and social disability. Let us begin the examination of the hand with general observation, noting the bony and soft tissue contours. Check for any congenital or developmental factors, deformities like swan neck and boutonniere. Note any contractures such as Dubutrens or Volkmann's ischemic contracture. Observe the general hand and finger posturing and any radial or ulnar deviation of the digits, the carpals, or the wrist. Note any increased or decreased muscular activity, fasciculations, and wasting especially of the thinner or interossei muscles. Note any trophic changes of the skin and nails, swellings, ganglia, or other nodules. Then palpate the intrinsic muscles and the various anatomical structures like the scaphoid, the anatomical snuff box, and the carpals. Feel the first metacarpal phalangeal joint and the tendons for nodule formation. Examine the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis for evidence of the Guervain's synovitis. Feel the ulnar nerve for the tunnel of Guillon. Then evaluate the active movements. With outstretched arms and hands, get them to push their palms upwards, then downwards. Get them to perform some ulnar deviation, then radial deviation at the wrists. Ask them to make a fist and to extend the fingers. Finally, get them to rotate their hands at the wrists. Note the ease by which these movements are performed, the range achieved, the presence of pain and crepitations. Finally, check the movements of the thumb in abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, and opposition. Then evaluate the passive movements holding the patient's hand in supination. Take the wrist into flexion, extension, ulnar deviation, and radial deviation. Then shear the proximal carpal row on the radius, and then the proximal on the distal carpal rows. Then assess the digits in turn, moving and palpating the metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints. Finally, assess the thumb in its physiological ranges. Then assess the active resisted movements of the wrist and fingers. Evaluate flexion and extension of the wrist, flexion extension of the fingers, abduction of the fingers, ulna deviation, radial deviation. 
and or position of the thumb. Note the muscle strength, joint stability, the presence of pain or crepitations and compare with the opposite side. If you need to assess some common functional movements, you may wish to ask the patient to pick up an object, to push or pull on a fixed handle, open a door or the lid of a jar, turn a key in a lock, make a fist, and to mimic typing or playing an instrument.